The fault. We believe that all men are created equal. To the magnificent mosaic that is America. From radio beacon to radio beacon. I have a dream. Change has come to America. Believe it. Knock, knock. Who's there? Hey. It's a figment of your imagination. Randy Road Show. Turn up your mind. No wonder they're so emboldened. No wonder they feel so... You know, it's like I've heard different accounts from 40 to 60,000 people. Good fighters, ISIS. Good fighters. Smart. Good. Oh, wow. <laughs> and I said, they asked me, because I'm running for president. I'm leading in almost all the polls. And they asked me a question about ISIS. And I say to the announcer, I don't really want to answer it. And the next day, these idiots over here say, Trump doesn't know the answer. The reason I don't want to answer because I don't want to tell the enemy if I win, I don't want to have to. Does that make sense? I don't want to tell them that I'm going to cut and run. <laughs> so two weeks go by and I get the question again. How would you fight ISIS, Mr. Trump, if you're president? I said, do I have to answer it? Do I have to? They said, Mr. Trump, we really think it's appropriate. And I did too, because I was getting killed in the press is saying I'm not, I know more about ISIS than the, the generals do, believe me. I said, all right, so here's what I do. I hated to do it, oh, I hated to do it. Because I think I'm gonna win. Believe me. Wow, uh, this is unbelievable. So he, he didn't want to tell everybody that his uh, big plan for ISIS was to just uh, you know, pr hope they go away and to cut and run. Wow, this has been amazing. This has been so sick. This is really uh, damaging our country now. Um, yesterday, I think I titled the show, This is How It Starts. Why? Because this is how the complete and utter demolition of a democracy starts. This is what it looks like. This is how it feels. Uh, these are the conditions uh, under which a, a democracy can fail. Not will, but can fail. Uh, there is just no question about it. What we have here is a president who, with uh, his threats of shutting down the government, with his uh, tariff threats, with his um, inability to make a decision and to uh, keep to it, has rattled and shaken the markets. Our 401ks, we just had the worst year since 2008. Since 2008, okay? So he has just uh, completely rattled uh, the entire uh, uh, stock market, the global markets, we have a looming shutdown also rattling uh, the markets. We have um, a withdrawal now, uh, just a cut and run from Syria. Again, I keep telling you about the Kurds. Uh, they're going to get slaughtered. Erdogan has wanted to slaughter them forever. Uh, this will preclude us from ever having an alliance with any other foreign fighting group like, uh, you know, when when Russia invaded Afghanistan, we had the Mujahideen, OK? Uh, and when uh, we needed help fighting ISIS and combat fighters to go into Syria and Raqqa and Idlib and, and, and Aleppo, the Kurds did it. They did the, the all, all, all the combat fighting. We were training them. We were advising them. We were arming them. We were giving them air cover. But these were the people that were spilling their blood. These were the people that fought with us in Iraq also uh, for 15 years, the Kurds. So we have a, a slaughter coming of uh, friendlies where uh, p taking half of our troops out of Afghanistan where we were in the middle of negotiations for a political settlement in Afghanistan with the two sides with the Taliban and with the government uh, and now we're gonna pull our troops out sending a message to the Taliban uh, take the country Go ahead, you could do it again. And they will plot and they will plan in a vacuum, uh, you know, their revenge against the people who have uh, been fighting them for the last 17 years. We have uh, 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 metastasizing investigations into Trump land. You have, uh, you know, uh, New York State now bringing charges against his charity. Uh, you have a new chief of staff in the White House who's also, um, I don't know, what is the uh, Office of Management and Budget and running the consumer for, I, it's just so sick. We got one guy doing all the, and, and we got about 800,000 workers whose entire Christmas and, uh, go, you know, 2019 paychecks are all hanging in the balance as the Senate debates whether or not it will give this madman named Donald Trump this stupid freaking wall that we don't need. And on top of it, on top of it, 
Our, we don't have a Secretary of Defense. Our Secretary of Defense resigned yesterday right at the end of the show, and I told you, I said to you, this is major, this is bad, this is unfreaking believable when I left, I, uh, you know, the when he submitted his resignation to Donald Trump yesterday afternoon, the reason why we didn't know anything about it until into well into the five o'clock hour, even though this happened at 327 Eastern time, is because the White House was lying and they were saying that Mattis was retiring. They were lying and they wouldn't release the letter, the protest letter that Mattis wrote to the president, an open letter. And so everybody was kind of believing, uh, you know, that Mattis was talking about or thinking about retiring. It wasn't until the Pentagon itself put the letter out that everyone understood that the White House had been lying. Stephen Miller was asked, why did the president lie again to the American people? Why did he say Mattis was retiring when Mattis obviously quit and quit in protest and wrote a letter? Oh, my God, this letter. I'll read it to you. It's just it, the word ally and alliances and respect for and NATO and alliances and allies and alliances is in this letter over and over and over and over again, talking about how NATO is essential to uh, uh, the, the, the freedom of the world, let alone the United States, and, you know, and, and talking about I mean, there's a, there's a sentence in here why people haven't glommed onto. I, you know, they're 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 very busy saying, uh, you know, quoting him saying, "You deserve a Secretary of Defense who agrees with you," or whatever it is. Um, not that you want a Secretary of Defense who's a yes man in any way, shape, or form. You want a Secretary of Defense with lots and lots of warfighting experience, with lots and lots of experience planning uh, everything from uh, invasions to retreats to retrograde activities to you know uh, pulling back. You want somebody who. And Mattis is that guy. He understands all that. And, and you know, and, but he actually says in his letter that the president is shaping this world in accordance with China and Russia's wishes. Holy crap! And they lied and said that the president uh, that 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 Mattis was retire that that he was uh, you know retiring. No, he quit in protest. Then the president said uh, that Mattis is retiring. Uh, why didn't and Mattis, Mattis is quitting? He's not retiring. He's quitting in protest over the president's policy. So why is the president saying in that statement he made on Twitter that Mattis is retiring? Well, James Mattis is retiring. At the same time as oh Mattis said, the president's entitled to a secretary of defense that has strong alignment with his views. And I think that's something that all Americans could agree with. But it's also very agree, normal. Stephen, it's assume, also well, well, it's also very normal at this point in the administration to have turnover. A Secretary Mattis turnover. had always made it clear to the president from the beginning he didn't plan on staying through the entire administration. But this is an opportunity what? for the whole country to get a new Secretary of Defense who will be aligned with the president on these critical issues. Whether you're talking about in Syria, whether you're talking about across the Middle East in general, whether you're talking about other countries paying their fair share, and the whole America First agenda of this president. But in his letter. Mattis lays out his views, and, and let me just briefly summarize some of those views. It's a very long letter that he writes. Uh, he stands by, uh, he says, treating allies with respect and being clear-eyed clear -eyed about malign actors and competitors. And then he says, because the president has a right to a defense secretary whose views are better aligned with his, he's stepping down. That sounds to me, Stephen, like a very strong rebuke of the president's policies, isn't it? Well, it sounds to me like... Secretary Mattis believes the president is entitled to a Secretary of Defense who is better aligned with his views. At the same time, this president had a great relationship with Secretary Mattis and thanks him for his service. But let's let's talk about the big picture here, Wolf. The media that's having this hysterical reaction to James Mattis retiring the media? is the same media in many cases, the, media. the same politicians in many cases, who cheered our nation into a war in Iraq that it turned out to be an absolute catastrophe. Um, I believe that that was the Republicans that did that. You know, uh, just color me, uh, you know, uh, just confused by Stephen Miller, who, by the way, did you notice he stopped spraying topics on his head? He didn't have the widow's peak in that particular video. He had the, 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 the shiny bald head. Apparently, uh, you know, the news got to him. The spray on hair makes you look ridiculous. 
president thanks him for his service, and, uh, you know, he deserves a yes man in the Department of Defense. And, uh, you know, uh, Mattis did retire. No, Mattis didn't retire. He's at work right now, okay? He, he, he went to work at 6.15 this morning, as he always does. The letter that Mattis wrote lays out exactly why he quit. And then there's a backstory to it that the reporters were able to get, journalists were able to get. But let me read you this letter. This is just amazing. You know, I've been, he, he first says the obvious, you know, I've been privileged to serve. Not you. This is amazing how he does not say, I'm, not, I'm privileged to serve you. It was an honor to serve you. It's amazing. He says, I've been privileged to serve as our country's 26th Secretary of Defense, which has allowed me to serve alongside our men and women of the Department of Defense, of our citizens, and our ideals. Nothing in there about proud to serve alongside you, sir. No. I am proud of the progress that's been made over the past two years on some of the key goals articulated in our national defense strategy, putting the department on a more sound budgetary footing. Well, of course, he got, you know, $716 billion for his department. So improving readiness and lethality in our forces and reforming the department's business practices for greater performance. Our troops continue to provide the capabilities needed to prevail in conflict and sustain strong U.S. global influence. Here's where he gets to it. One core belief I have always held is that our strength as a nation is inextricably linked to the strength of our unique and comprehensive system of alliances and partnerships. While the U.S. remains the indispensable nation in the free world, we cannot protect our interests. We cannot serve that role effectively without maintaining strong alliances and showing respect to those allies like you. I have said from the beginning that the armed forces of the United States should not be the policemen of the world. Instead, we must use all tools of American power to provide for the common defense, including providing effective leadership to our alliances. NATO's 29 democracies demonstrated that strength in their commitment to fighting alongside us following the 9-11 attack on America, the defeat ISIS coalition of 74 nations is further proof. And here's where he really sticks it to him. He says, similarly, I believe we must be resolute and unambiguous in our approach to those countries whose strategic interests are increasingly in tension with ours. It is clear that China and Russia want to shape a world consistent with their authoritarian model gaining veto authority over other nations, economic, diplomatic, and security decisions to promote their own interests at the expense of America, their neighbors, our allies. That's the sixth mention. This is why we must use all the tools of American power to provide for the common defense. Here we go again. My view on treating allies with respect and also being clear-eyed about both malign actors and strategic competitors, again, Russia, China, are strongly held and informed by over four decades of immersion in these issues. We must do everything possible to advance an international order that is the most conducive to our security, our prosperity and values. And we are strengthened in this effort by the solidarity of our, yes, I hear you, alliances. Then comes the paragraph way after that. Because you have the right to a Secretary of Defense whose views are better aligned with yours, which is to pee on NATO, embarrass them in Europe, uh, kowtow to, to Putin in Helsinki, uh, uh, go on bended knee to Erdogan, hand over the Kurds to Erdogan on a silver freaking platter, no less. Uh, 
He says, because you have the right to a secretary of defense whose views are better aligned with yours on these and other subjects, I believe it's right for me to step down from my position. The end date for my tenure, February 28th, a date that should allow sufficient time for a successor to be nominated and confirmed, as well as to make sure the department's interests are properly articulated and protected at the upcoming events to include congressional posture hearings, meaning I'm going to brief Congress before I go, okay, and the NATO defense ministerial meeting in February. I need to go and tell our allies in the NATO alliance just exactly how effed up you are and how loyal you've become to Russia, to Putin, to China, to Turkey, to Erdogan, and to North freaking Korea. I will go and get, you know, give the bad news to our allies in person at the NATO defense ministerial meeting in February. Further, a full transition to a new secretary of defense occurs well in advance, yeah, not with this guy, of the transition of the chairman of the Joint Chiefs, because Dunford's leaving too. I pledge my full effort to a smooth transition that ensures the needs and interests of the 2.15 million service members the 732,079 DOD civilians, these are the GS 1s, 2s, 3s, right? Everybody knows what they are if you've served. With, uh, make sure that they receive undistraction, uh, undistracted attention at the department at all times so they can fulfill their critical round-the-clock mission to protect the American people. And then the closing is really stunning. I very much appreciate this opportunity to serve the nation and our men and women in uniform, period. Not you. And they lied. All day yesterday, they lied. They said, oh, you know, we think Mattis is retiring. That was the story at, the, at 327. Now, apparently at 327, Mattis was in the Oval Office. Mattis had been there in the morning, and Mattis went back at 327 in the afternoon. Why? He wanted to try and talk the president out of giving Erdogan the Kurds on a silver platter, pulling the 2,000 advisors out of Syria who are advising and, and, and uh, you know, uh, uh, giving air support to the Kurds. And he tried and he tried and he couldn't do it. And so he had that letter with him and he pulled it out of his pocket and he gave it to the president and he said, I quit. The president refused to tell the American people that that had happened. It wasn't until the Pentagon released the letter because the president would not do it. He wouldn't even walk out and thank him or anything, nothing. All things Randy at randyrhodes.com. Go, go for launch. Speaking truth to power, the Randy Rhodes Show. Secretary Mattis was one of the few symbols the few items of strength and stability in this administration. Everything that indicates stability, everything that indicates strength, everything that indicates knowledge is leaving this administration. Oh my God. General Kelly, General Mattis, so many others. McMaster. At McMaster, exactly. <laughs> there is chaos now in this administration. This week was one of the most chaotic weeks we've ever seen in American government, and amazingly, they want to close the week, President Trump does, by shutting down the government. Under. Shutting down the government. Why? Now, we all know that Secretary Mattis had real disagreements with the president on Syria and on the wall. Some have speculated that the president was going to demand that he start building a wall, which he knows he can't do by law. Yep. And maybe that's one of the reasons he stepped down. Leaders, do you think there's any... Do you think there's any reasonable prospect that if there is a shutdown, you could override President Trump's veto of a CR in the next week or so? You'd have to ask our Republican friends. Yeah. Okay. It's very strange about how our Republican friends, the, the worse he gets, the more they rally round him. It's true. And this, uh, just to uh, refer back to what Leader Schumer has saying about the voice of stability uh, in, this, in this administration and the people who have left, you have leaders great leaders who have left the administration in dismay, and the rest of them have left in disgrace. <laughs> and that's a, what this administration has been about. We don't want to be um, fear mongers in terms of our country. This great country 
can withstand just about anything, but it shouldn't have to. Right. It shouldn't have to. There's, so, uh, uh, yes, I am shaken by the resignation of General Mattis for what it means to our country, for the message it sends to our troops, and for the indication of what his view is of the Commander-in-Chief. Are Americans less safe without Mattis running the Pentagon? Should they be fearful? Look, our military soldiers, the 2.15 million of them, our civilian employees in defense looked up to General Mattis. I'm sure they feel it's a great loss. I'm sure most Americans feel it's a great loss. And everything like this that happens, a resignation of a strong leader, gives the American people less and less faith in President Trump and the way he governs. It's just all the more reason for us to pray for our country. Oh, my God. Our country has been blessed in so many ways by leaders throughout the centuries, the decades, and some of them, one of them, General Mattis. This is a very sad day for our country. Read his letter. Have you read his letter? I did. Read his letter and examine the activities that have led up to it and what it means. Uh, because of his leadership, we are safe, yes. And we have to pray that we're safe and we have to continue to make sure the American people are sure we're safe. That's the oath of office we take to protect and defend, and we will. We shouldn't have to do so because of the temper tantrums of the commander in chief. Oh, that scared me. I have to say, I heard that on my way home, and it's it just it that scared me. You know, it just it, that Nancy Pelosi is saying, "Okay, it is time to pray for our country." Uh, I just want you to know that uh, we might be less safe today than we were yesterday. We can withstand just about anything. We shouldn't have to, but it's coming. So yeah, it's time to pray for your country. It's time for everybody to understand that the adult in the room has left the building. There is no one left around this president, who by the way has been in isolation. The president's been making decisions by talking to Rush Limbaugh, Sean Hannity, uh, listening, uh, he, he, he unfollowed Ann Coulter on Twitter because she uh, said he was a gutless president of a wall-less country. She's a ballless piece of turf. I mean, but you know, she lives here, and so does he, and they're all gonna have to, you know, go to the same Christmas uh, things. You know, uh, I mean, it's just so sick that we are being governed by Fox and Friends and Ann Coulter and talk radio and uh, talk, uh, talk TV. It's very sick, it's very scary, but yes, the president has been completely isolated and making all these rash decisions. I told you, he's doing everything on a whim. He consulted with no one about pulling troops out of uh, Syria. He consulted with, he didn't talk to our allies. He didn't talk to France. France has over a thousand troops there. He didn't talk to the UK. He didn't talk to, they've got troops there. He didn't talk to anybody, nobody, except for Erdogan in Turkey and Vlad. And the only person that thought this was a good idea was Vlad. Even Erdogan, who was screaming at him on the, you know, on the phone saying, my defense minister will slaughter the Kurds. We're, you know, you need to get out of there so that, you know, we could, and he, and Trump was given talking points to stand up to Erdogan and how to do it. And they put cards in front of him and everything. So he could get on that phone call with Erdogan and say, don't you threaten the United States and uh, we're not going to abandon our, our brothers in arms. We're not going to leave the Kurds for you to, you know, destroy them. Uh, we're not going to send a message to ISIS that we give up and that we cut and run right at the end. We're not going to send a message like that to uh, ISIS in uh, Iraq. We're not going to do it in Syria. We're not going to do it in Afghanistan. So, you know, those were the talking. And you know what Trump did? He threw them out the window and he told Erdogan, yeah, I agree with you. To the point where Erdogan, it was just an empty promise. It was an empty threat from Erdogan, right? Saying, you get out. You get out now or I'm going to slaughter the Kurds, right? And you know what Trump said to him? Okay, you're right. We're going to leave. I'm going to do it. You'll see it on TV. I'm going to announce it. We're going to leave. And Erdogan was like, whoa, 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 wait, 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 wait. A hasty pullout is not a good idea. So Trump has capitulated to ISIS, Turkey, Russia, everybody, Kim Jong-un. 
but he won't back down an inch on his idiotic wall because, you know, the real terrorist threat in this world is from toddlers wearing diapers who speak Spanish. Who know how to say, mommy. Oh, yeah, that's the real threat. This is, this is insane. Now, why, why is he doing this? Why is the president shutting down the government, bankrupting uh, the, the markets, firing everybody or, or, or letting everybody just walk away? I mean, it, I, want, I want to read this to you again. Not his letter. No, you, I, I think you get that, right? Do you remember in September? I know it's very hard to remember the beginning of the week. You know, Ryan Zinke resigned in shame this week. I mean, it's just so unbelievable, all this stuff that happened. And, uh, you know, uh, there, there's a mystery case, you know, going on. Uh, some, uh, you know, uh, some bank, I think, has been subpoenaed. I think it's the Bank of Cyprus. I think this has to do with Wilbur Ross. I think this has to do with the Bank of Cyprus because uh, every, every uh, you know, autocrat, has their money in that Bank of Cyprus. And Wilbur Ross was the vice chair of the Bank of, of Cyprus right up until the day he was confirmed to be our Secretary of Commerce. And that Bank of he was vice chair. The other vice chair, it was a shared chairmanship, was a Russian. A Russian. With ties to Vlad. And the two of them were vice chairs of the Bank of Cyprus. Uh, and, 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 and I mean, uh, the, the amount of money laundering that went through there, for, you know, yes, it would, it would solve all the problems of everybody wondering, is it Deutsche Bank? Well, Deutsche Bank is a publicly traded company, so it can't be Deutsche Bank because their rules wouldn't prohibit uh, us from finding out, you know, like uh, their banking practices. This has to be somebody, you know, a country that's a sovereign bank uh, that belongs to the country. And, you know, I look at Deutsche Bank and uh, uh, Ross, when, when Wilbur Ross uh, went to the Bank of Cyprus, the first big decision that he, ma that he made at that bank was he appointed the former Deutsche Bank CEO, Joseph Ackerman, as chairman. And Ackerman was the guy who had this great relationship with Putin and uh, Server Bank. So there's, uh, you know, it's, it just seems to me that, that 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 bank is the bank where all the, the dirty laundering uh, happened. Make a long story short, that happened this week. Uh, you've got so much going on. But here, I want you to remember back to September 4th. Why? Because on September 4th, this was crazy, the New York Times had published an op-ed by an anonymous senior White House official. And now I'm starting to think it was Jim Mattis. I mean, I knew to this day we don't know who it was, but we know everybody is gone now who might be considered an adult. Even John Kelly, that racist scum, uh, was considered an adult. Uh, McMaster was considered an adult. Uh, Gary Cohen was considered an adult. Uh, Rex Tillerson was considered an adult. Uh, obviously, Mattis was considered the most important person standing between us and Armageddon. So I'm just going to read this uh, short little op-ed again to you. And uh, you just think about what this person who anonymously wrote this in the New York Times was trying to tell you back in September. And now it's all, the, the president's all by himself. He, 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 he literally talks to nobody. He consults with nobody. He bounces ideas off of nobody. His uh, foreign policy is his own. It has absolutely nothing to do with our allies. It has nothing to do with NATO. It has nothing to do with treaties that we're signatories to. It has nothing to do with nuclear treaties or arms agreements or any other thing. It has nothing to do with Paris. It has, uh, the Paris Accord it has nothing to do with the Iran nuclear deal anymore. The rest of the world is still involved in those things. Only we have removed ourselves from those things. Here's what they wrote, the senior White House official. They wrote, President Trump is facing a test to his presidency unlike any faced by a modern American leader. It's not just that the special counsel looms large or that the country is bitterly divided over Mr. Trump's leadership or even that his party might well lose the House to an opposition hellbent on his downfall, which has happened. The dilemma, which he does not fully grasp, is that many of the senior officials in his own administration 
are working diligently from within to frustrate parts of his agenda and his worst inclinations, I would know I am one of them. To be clear, ours is not the popular resistance of the left. We want the administration to succeed. But we believe our first duty is to this country. And the president continues to act in a manner that is detrimental to the health of our republic. And that is why many Trump appointees have vowed to do what we can to preserve our democratic institutions while thwarting Mr. Trump's more misguided impulses until he is out of office. The root of the problem is the president's amorality. Anyone who works with him knows he is not moored to any discernible first principles that guide his decision making. Although he was elected as a Republican, the president shows little affinity for ideals long espoused by conservatives, free minds, free markets, free people. At best, he invokes these ideals in scripted settings, but at worst, he has attacked them outright. In addition to his mass marketing of the notion that the press is the enemy of the people, President Trump's impulses are generally anti-trade and anti-democratic. There are bright spots that the near ceaseless negative coverage of the administration fails to capture, deregulation, tax reform, a more robust military. Yeah, except we're not gonna use it. He's gonna use the military as a slush fund. But these successes have come despite, not because of the president's leadership style, which is impetuous, adversarial, petty, and ineffective. Why, everybody? It's the quad. It's the quad. It's the quad factor. From the White House to executive branch departments and agencies, senior officials will privately admit their daily disbelief at the commander in chief's comments and actions. Most are working to insulate their own operations from his whims. Meetings with him veer all off topic, off the rails. He engages in repetitive rants. His impulsiveness results in half-baked, ill-informed, and occasionally reckless decisions that have to be walked back. Quote, there is literally no telling whether he might change his mind from one minute to the next. A top official complained to me recently, exasperated by an Oval Office meeting at which the president flip-flopped on a major policy decision he had made only a week earlier. The erratic behavior would be more concerning if it wasn't for our unsung heroes in and around the White House. Some of his aides have been cast as villains by the media, but in private, they've gone to great lengths to keep bad decisions contained to the West Wing, though they are clearly not always successful. See, this is why I don't think it could be Kelly. First of all, it's, it's, it's um, not racist. And second, I think it was Kelly who he was quoting, whoever wrote this. Listen to this. It may be cold comfort in this chaotic era, but Americans should know that there are adults in the room. We fully recognize what is happening, and we are trying to do what's right even when Donald Trump won't. The result is a two-track presidency. Foreign policy, in public and in private, President Trump shows a preference for autocrats and dictators, such as President Vladimir Putin of Russia and North Korea's Kim Jong-un, and displays little genuine appreciation for the ties that bind us to allied, like-minded nations. Astute observers have noted, though, that the rest of the administration is operating on another track, one where countries like Russia are called out for their meddling and punished, and where allies around the world are engaged as peers rather than ridiculed. On Russia, for instance, the president was reluctant to expel so many of Mr. Putin's spies as punishment for poisoning a former Russian spy in Britain, Skripal. He complained for weeks about senior staff members letting him get boxed into further confrontation with Russia, and he expressed frustration that the United States continued to impose sanctions on the country for its malign behavior. But his national security team knew better. Such actions had to be taken. We had to hold Moscow accountable. 
This is not the work of a so-called deep state. It is the work of a steady state. Given the instability many witnessed, there were early whispers within the cabinet of invoking the 25th Amendment, which would start a complex process for removing the president, but no one wanted to precipitate a constitutional crisis. So we will do what we can to steer the administration in the right direction until one way or another it is over. The bigger concern is not what Mr. Trump has done to the presidency but rather what we as a nation have allowed him to do to us. We have sunk low with him and allowed our discourse to be stripped of civility. Senator John McCain put it best in his farewell letter, all Americans should heed his words and break free of the tribalism trap with the high aim of uniting through our share of values and our love of this nation. We may no longer have Senator McCain, but we will always have his example, a lodestar for restoring honor to public life and a national dialogue. Mr. Trump may fear such honorable men, but we should revere them. There is a quiet resistance within the administration of people choosing to put country first. But the real difference will be made by everyday citizens rising above politics, reaching across the aisle, and resolving to shed the labels in favor of a single one, Americans. That was an anonymously lit, uh, uh, written op-ed in the New York Times by somebody who is a senior official in the Trump administration. And it just, it, it just makes me believe that that was Mattis all along, trying to send some sort of a signal, a nonpartisan signal, saying we're in deep doo-doo, man, and uh, you know we just want you to know the only thing standing between us and Armageddon, us and aligning with, uh, you know, not aligning. Listen, Putin has an asset in the Oval Office. Putin, this is Putin's foreign policy. This is Putin's preferred outcome for our markets. This is Putin's government shutdown. I mean, just all these things happening, uh, you know, like a one perfect storm. We're going to have a, a, a government shutdown. We're going to have uh, uh, uncertain markets. We're going to have uh, no secretary of defense. We're going to have a commander in chief who's making decisions in isolation all at the same time. I mean, uh, what? This is the beginning of, of, of what uh, the, the end of democracy looks like. This is what you've been wanting to see. Next, to speak to Randy, call 561-270-3844. 561-270-3844. Okay, this is our former CIA director, former Secretary of Defense, and a former Chief of Staff, uh, Leon Panetta, okay? Yeah. Uh, th this this scares you. This is a president who doesn't like to sit down with advisors and those experienced in foreign policy and national defense policy and listen to them, listen to their advice. Every president in, in recent history takes the time to listen to his advisors because they know, frankly, a hell of a lot more than the president does. Uh, and so the responsibility here is to listen to that advice and to understand the consequences and what it means to the interests of the United States. But this is a president who operates by somehow his gut instinct and also I think of how he reads the politics yep. of the moment. Mm -hmm. uh, he enjoys chaos because he thinks chaos produces attention for him. But the problem is chaos, a steady diet of chaos, creates hell for the American people. We need stability right now. We need a sense that we have a president who's going to take the time to make the right decisions and provide stability for this country. And we don't have that. And now, you know, like I, I think it was Gary in Fort Lauderdale who called yesterday. He nailed it. He hit it right on the head, Gary did. He said, you know, uh, the whole market, the whole recovery, the whole economy was Obama's. And uh, Trump was riding on the coattails of every Obama policy. And and quietly he was, uh, you know, undoing things. And now it's his economy. And now it's his war. And now it's his 
a, a, a Republican Party, and now it's his crisis, and his markets are tumbling, and his party is splitting, and 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 he's pulling us out of every uh, alliance and every treaty and everything. And the rest of the world is uh, you know doing its thing, uh, but we're the ones that are being you know damaged and denigrated and and hobbled down to the ground. It's exactly what Putin wanted for America. I mean, exactly. Putin would want America to go broke. It would want America to go bankrupt. It would want American markets to, to tank. It would want the government shut down. It would want the Republican Party in tatters. It would want, you know, uh, 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 you know, people starving. Oh, and by the way, you know what else happened? So the farm bill, right? They passed the farm bill. And I told you the other day, uh, you know, about 800,000 people just uh, escaped a complete and utter uh, demolition of their uh, ability to eat food in this country. Uh, it turns out that, you know, the uh, work requirements for uh, SNAP were not in this uh, bill at all, right? And the reason why it was not in this bill is because the farmers took it, you know, like to the gut on his stupid tariffs that soybean farmers needed to get bailed out. And so the farm bill for Republicans became a very big deal to get passed because farmers live in rural America where there's land and they were going broke. So the Republicans knew they had to pass a farm bill and they didn't have time to argue about work requirements for food stamps. Turns out that Donald Trump is without consultation uh, Donald Trump is going to, by executive uh, decree, he is going to demand that 2. Point, there's 3.8 million people who get food stamps. 2.8 million of them uh, live in rural areas. 40% of America lives in uh, rural areas. And he is going to tell them that if they don't work, they don't eat. I mean, Putin would love this. They'd starve, just starve. That's going to get struck down by the Supreme Court. Oh, and speaking of the Supreme Court, oh, I have to show you something so cool. You see this right here? Look at this. You know, I've always had my Obama. That's my Obama, right? So my boys, my team, who I love, and they love me. Uh, today, they bought me a Ruth Bader Ginsburg for Christmas. This is like my favorite Christmas present. I love this thing. And they bought me uh, my 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 cup, <laughs> my new cup. But I gotta I gotta say uh, that it was crazy because, you know, Scotty and Brett gave me a Ruth Bader Ginsburg to go with my Barack Obama on a day when I found out that Ruth Bader Ginsburg, when she broke her ribs, you know, they X-rayed her chest and found some nodules in her left lung that they didn't like the looks of. And she just had surgery to remove these nodules that turned out to be, oh yes, malignant. Ruth Bader Ginsburg had the very, very, very early stages of lung cancer. And she didn't tell anybody. She's been giving speeches, she's been voting, she's been on the court, she's been hearing cases. And by the way, today, uh, there was a five to four vote and Ruth Bader Ginsburg was in the hospital and the notorious RBG said, I wanna vote. I'm going to vote. And they let her vote from her hospital bed, and thank God she was able to because this vote was whether or not the president can unilaterally change the intent of Congress, meaning the laws by himself, and ban people from claiming asylum in this country if they didn't come through a legal port of entry. Well, you know, the law in this country, as decided by Congress and previous, a previous president who signed it into law, says that if you are here, present in the United States of America, if you get here, no matter how you got here, and you have a, f a toe on American soil, and you have credible fear of going back to your country, then you will be heard and your claim of asylum is valid. Well, the president tried to undo that by executive order uh, in a lower court. You know, Ninth Circuit said no. And uh, now the Supreme Court has also said no. But it was five to four. And so Ruth had to, uh, you know, uh, RBG had to make her vote from the hospital bed. You know who joined us, though? Chief Justice John Roberts. He, 
he has had it with this uh, with this president in politics and thinking he's a unitary executive. Uh, I will say Gorsuch and Kavanaugh and Clarence, all the, the usual suspects, they said, sure, the president can change the law by himself. Now, that's going to be important to you people out there in the hinterlands who do get food stamps because that's another thing that you're going to get for Christmas is taken off of food stamps. That affects almost 3 million people. 3 million people. It's the sickest Christmas present I ever saw. It's certainly not a Ruth Bader Ginsburg little, uh, you know, statuary. It's better than any Capitamonte they ever sold on home shopping, ever. Jim in California. Yes, Jim. Yes. Uh, Thank you for your service, number one. Number two, I just want to reach out and wish everyone, all of your listeners, all the people that put this together, a happy Christmas, Hanukkah, and Kwanzaa. Keep up the good work. Thank you. And and Boxing Day. And yeah, and box. Yeah, you know what Boxing Day is? Yeah, my uh, the Angie, my my friend. No, my 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 definition of Boxing Day. What is it? It's when everybody finds out who was doing all the wrong things the night before, and they beat the crap out of each other. <laughs> oh, I see. Now it's putting. No, a... I know what Boxing Day. It's, okay. a, it's a great day. It is a and, great day. And thank you for your service. I mean, we need this more than ever. And onward and upward, next year is going to be a fantastic year. Oh, I just hope it's a year of justice, is what it is. So yes, he's you know, Merry Christmas to you too, Jim, and thank you for that uh, sentiment. I have to say uh, that this is the last show of 2018. We have one more hour, and then um, I'm going to release my guys to be with their family uh, all through New Year's, and then we'll be back on uh, January the second. I believe it's a Wednesday. Mm-hmm. And uh, we'll begin, uh, you know, the countdown to the Democratic Congress and the subpoenas and the testimony uh, in public. And the debunking of, uh, you know, every lie that this president has, you know, dared to tell. But we do have one more hour. I just want to say we're closing out the year. And so if you are in a position, I know Christmas is uh, expensive for everybody. It is for us, too. But if you're in a position to make a donation, if you're in a position to give us a nice closing amount for the year to help us start the first of the year with our bills paid, Oh, please do go to randyroads.com slash support or go buy, buy a stinking podcast and get yourself set up because 2019 is going to be, oh my God. But you see, I believe that 19 is going to be the justice that we watched go undone. So we need border security and the Republicans in the Senate, as you know, are taking it up today. And it's really up to the Democrats, totally up to the Democrats as to whether or not we have a shutdown. Uh, It's possible that we'll have a shutdown. I would say the chances are probably very good because I don't think Democrats care so much about maybe this issue, but this is a very big issue. It's an issue of crime. It's an issue of safety. It's an issue of of, uh, least importantly dollars. Uh, Spend $285 billion a year on illegal immigration. We have to finally do it. The wall will pay for itself on a monthly basis. I mean, literally every month it pays for itself. So we're talking about small amounts of money. Think of it, we approved and we got good Democrat support. Military last year, $700 billion. Recently, $716 billion for the military. So use them. And here we're talking about $5 billion. So it's a tiny fraction, but unfortunately, uh, they've devoted their lives to making sure it doesn't happen. And that wasn't for what should happen. That was for political reasons. So uh, we are going to be working very hard to get something passed in the Senate. There's a very good chance it won't get passed. It's up to the Democrats. So it's really the Democrat shutdown. Because we've done our thing. You know, when Nancy Pelosi said, you'll never get the votes in the House, we got them, and we got them by a big margin. 217 to 185. So now it's up to the Democrats as to whether or not we have a shutdown tonight. I hope we don't, but we're totally prepared for a very long shutdown. A very long shutdown. He says he's totally prepared. Meanwhile, all the agencies are saying they have they're not prepared because last week uh, he was saying that he would sign 
the continuing resolution. I, I, I refer to that as a, uh, a profile and courage that the Republicans managed to fund the government until the 8th of February. Oh, a real profile and courage with a, Dem with a Republican House and a Republican Senate and a Republican president. And then all of a sudden, he heard Rush Limbaugh on the radio. And Ann Coulter started tweeting at him. And, and talk radio and, and, and the, the morons on Fox and Friends sitting there uh, yelling at him that he's a, a, a ballless, wallless president or whatever. And all of a sudden, he's on, on following Ann Coulter and he's changing his mind, changing his mind and shifting it. And I swear to God, this, the, the Senate is, it has, has had a procedural vote open for hours now, for freaking hours, trying to avoid a shutdown of the government over a wall that he said Mexico would pay for. And last night when Stephen Miller, who decided not to do spray on hair, showed up on the TV, he was asked, why in the world are you blaming Democrats? The president repeatedly said, American taxpayers will not pay for this wall. Mexico will pay for the wall. Who's going to pay for the wall? Mexico. And who's going to pay for Mexico? And now he's blaming others because he couldn't deliver on Mexico paying for a wall? Why should American taxpayers have to pay for the wall along the border with Mexico? Why should almost a million federal workers have to work uh, the half a million law enforcement types over the, the Christmas holidays without their paychecks Seriously. over something the president of the United States as a candidate and as president repeatedly promised to the American people that Mexico would pay for the wall. Why okay, isn't so Mexico? Few... The president said he guaranteed it. Mexico would pay. Mexico clearly, the former government, the new government, said they're not paying. Thank you for asking the question. So first of all, as the president has said, as we've all said, the wall will be paid for through the savings on trade alone. Oh I, but my I want to explain God. to you and your audience. If, so if that hold will on, happen, please, why no, do you need $5 billion dollars right glad now if me, Mexico is going to come up I'm, with it with some, I, I, some other way? I'm, I'm glad you're giving me the chance to answer the question because as you know, Wolf, in Washington budgeting, an offset is different than an allocation. So even though this trade savings offset the cost, Congress still has to allocate the funding. So even though it's fully paid for by trade savings, ha! Congress has to allocate the money. But it's also fully paid for in another very important way, which is the cost of illegal immigration. Everyone talks about the cost of the wall. The cost of the wall is pennies compared to the cost of illegal immigration. You obviously can't measure the cost of the lives that are lost to illegal immigration on both sides of the border. And all the, uh, the horrible things done by vicious and sinister cartels and coyotes. But at the same time, the cost of drugs alone, according to our Council on Whoa. Economic Advisors, heroin, over $230 billion a year. Over 90% of it comes to the border. Okay, let's just stop this moron right here. First of all, let's deal with the trade. Uh, then let's deal with the heroin. Heroin comes through legal ports of entry. Her heroin is shipped in here in trucks, in cars. Do they want to end all commerce? with Mexico because if they do they should shut if they if they're looking to interdict uh, you know uh, the drugs uh, then they're going to have to you know uh, shut down the legal ports of entry where all commerce is done that's how the drugs come into this country uh, the other drug problems that we have in this country besides for well the fentanyl and the synthetic heroines uh, they come from China in the mail methamphetamine is manufactured uh, by the cast of Breaking Bad in a trailer by Heisenberg, uh, you know, uh, somewhere in the New Mexican desert. Only half kidding. And only kidding about Brian Cranston making the math for real. Okay, but that is uh, you know, the story of meth. Uh, and uh, the opioid addiction is uh, prescribed by doctors. So I don't know. I don't know what fantasy land they're living in, but uh, okay. And then let's deal with the uh, issue. Will the renegotiated NAFTA, which is just it's a, it's a touch of a tad of a little something, nothing much to talk about here, uh, that hasn't been ratified by Congress and it has to be by the Senate and signed off by the President. It there is no deal in place at all, and already he's spending fantasy phantom money that he thinks is going to come pouring into the treasury which should be to the benefit of the american taxpayers but oh no he wants to spend money we don't even have yet 
on a deal that isn't even enacted yet on a stupid wall. Also, there is no indication, according to any economics professor, advisor, uh, nobody who studies trade deals, nobody who knows anything about trade deals, believes that the U.S. will, will receive much more new money uh, into the U.S. Treasury through this UMSCA thing. Phil Levy, a senior fellow at the Chicago Council on Global Affairs. He ticked through possible revenue from a trade deal, either directly or indirectly from higher tariffs or, uh, you know, uh, uh, um, increased economic activity. He said there's nothing to suggest that the USMCA will land the government a windfall on either account. Quote, there's nothing that earmarks this type of money for a wall. Your income taxes or corporate taxes, they go into general revenue, but it's still the budget process that determines where these funds go, and it's the budget process that Trump has stymied. Republicans in the Senate are trying to find Trump a way back from the ledge of his shutdown, but this claim that Mexico will directly or indirectly or through trade pay for this wall is garbage. It's never, ever going to happen. And all of this is because Trump can't deliver. He couldn't deliver on his ridiculous promise to make Mexico pay for his wall. And here we are looking at a shutdown, which he is trying desperately to to, to, to put Stephen Miller on TV. Uh, he put uh, Sarah Huckabee on uh, Lou Dobbs last night. He's got Rush Limbaugh. He's got, uh, you know, a, a crazy right wing talk radio saying, oh, no, uh, the wall will indirectly be paid for. Somehow it, it it will you know it will be and, and it's just it's all garbage it's crap it's never ever 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 going to happen and the Democrats are livid they are seriously angry. All of these promises about a a border wall were followed by the cheers and the chants of and who's going to pay for that wall? And you remember Mexico. all your fans would stand up and they, Mexico's going to pay for that wall. Who? Mexico. And here we are today getting ready to shut down the government over you asking the American taxpayer to pay for this border wall. And then some of you even used to say, are saying that, that we have hollow words that our words don't mean anything. Huh. When this president is going back on the promise that he made, he said Mexico was going to pay for it. He said it at the rallies. He was in Ohio. He was in the swing states. And now he's going back on his word on that. And he just went back on his word where he promised the entire Senate he was going to support the continuing resolution. And you're calling us and saying our words are hollow? Are you kidding me? Now look, I'm for border security. I'm for border security, but I'm not for a wall. You know what? I like cars too. I'm for cars. I'm not for the Model T. Got it. I like planes. I don't want a glider that was designed and built by Wilbur Wright. Right. I like my phone, but I don't want to go back and get the rotary dial out. Oh, I do. You guys are living in the past. And this government is in chaos. It's in a free fall. The market's in a free fall. The staffing at the White House is in a free fall. The Secretary of Defense is gone. We're pulling out of Syria. What is going on? You are in charge of the House, Senate, and White House. Get a grip and learn how to govern the country. Beautiful. That's uh, Representative Tim Ryan. Beautiful. Well done. Ma Maisie Hirono, she doesn't mince words. Maisie Hirono just put it out there. And of course, uh, Trump's worldview is uh, uh, is very 
how should I say, out of whack because he comes up with it himself. And uh, these last two days, I feel as though we have been on a roller coaster with him at the uh, controls because first there's the announcement that we're getting out of Syria where we know that he didn't discuss it with anybody, including General Mattis, and uh, giving a huge Christmas present to Putin and to Iran. Then, because I've been very focused on what's going on at the border, they make an announcement that people who, come, uh, who are coming through for asylum purposes have to wait on the Mexican side where there are huge safety concerns for so many of the children. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, the Senate did the responsible thing last night by keeping government running, passing this bill by a voice vote and only to have President Trump get all worked up because he's got some right wing loud people yelling at him on Fox News and suddenly he says, well, I don't think I'm going to sign it. So it is very true that he will <coughs> bring on the shutdown and he has to take responsibility for it. Any effort on his part to blame the Democrats will be such bullshit that, as I said before, I would hardly be able to stand it. <laughs> It would be such bullshit, I wouldn't be able to stand it. Does anybody remember that meeting he had like a week ago with Chuck and Nancy? I'll take the mantle. You put it on. I won't blame you. I won't blame you, Democrats. I'm going to shut down the government. I want a government shutdown. I want a government shutdown. I won't blame you. Now, today, he's like, I blame you. This man is erratic. He's he is, he's a bullshit person. He is. He just is. He's a complete bullshit person. He's a, a, a P.T. Barnum. He thinks a sucker is born every minute. He thinks that he could, you know, play fast and loose with our national security, with our, 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 our a million workers. They should all work and not get paid. And then, you know, Congress decides whether they get the back pay. Oh, my God. Holy crap. <laughs> show is live on randyroads.com and the free progressive voices app for android and ios visit the app store or progressivevoices.com now one thing i think we can agree on is we shouldn't shut down the government over a dispute and you want to shut it down I, you no, keep no, talking no, no, about no. the last time chuck you shut it down no 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 and then you open 20 it up times. very quickly and 20 times i don't want to do what you did 20 but, times chuck. you have called for i will shut down the government if i don't get my wool none of us have you said you want to know something you've said okay it. you want to put that you on you said mind. it i'll take it okay, okay good you know what i'll say <laughs> yes if we don't get what we want one way or the other whether it's through you through a military through anything you want to call I will shut down the government. Okay, Absolutely. fair enough. And we I am disagree. proud, and I'll we tell you disagree. what, I am proud to shut down the government for border security, Chuck, because the people of this country don't want criminals and people that have lots of problems and drugs pouring into our country. So <laughs> I will take the mantle. I will be the one to shut it down. I'm not going to blame you for it. Oh. The last time you shut it down, it didn't work. I will take the mantle Good. of shutting down. And I'm going to shut it down for border security. But we security. believe you shouldn't okay. shut it down. All right, so then that happened, and then today uh, this happened. So we need border security, and the Republicans in the Senate, as you know, are taking it up today, and it's really up to the Democrats, totally up to the Democrats as to whether or not we have a shutdown. Uh, it's possible that we'll have a shutdown. I would say the chances are probably very good, because I don't think Democrats care so much about maybe this issue. But Oh, he's such a freaking liar. All right, so you know what's in this bill, okay? This voice vote bill that Maisie, Maisie Hirono was telling you about, they passed it on a voice vote. You know what the vote was? A hundred to nothing. And in that bill, it was a continuing resolution to keep the government open uh, during a high threat period known as Christmas so that the TSA people at the airports didn't have to go without pay, border patrol didn't have to go without pay. The FBI didn't have to go without pay. And guess who else would work for free? The Justice Department. You know, and I really think this is why he's doing this. He's attacking Mueller's money, Mueller's funding. I bet you Whitaker, who, by the way, got an ethics opinion that said that he should recuse himself from all matters Russia, and he said, I'm not doing it. I mean, these are disgusting human beings. Uh, but 
you know, the idea that this man doesn't want the FBI to work. He doesn't want Border Patrol to work. He doesn't want the TSA to work. I mean, it, they will show up. They will work, but they will not get paid over Christmas or how. And now he's saying it'll be a very long shutdown and blaming it on the Democrats when just the other day he told Chuck Schumer, I will not blame you. Yes, I will take the mantle. I want to shut the guard. I mean, the whole setup here, a government shutdown, Mattis walks out the door, uh, the, the, the troops are out in the field with no secretary of defense, uh, Dunford is leaving, the Joint Chiefs, he's out the door. I mean, there's no adult in the room. Kelly is gone. Tillerson is gone. Uh, 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 Cohen is gone on the economy, right, because he didn't believe in the tariffs. He said it will tank this country. And so Trump said, you know, I'll accept your resignation. And he walks out the door. We got Larry Kudlow from TV actually designing our economy, our markets. I mean, Larry Kudlow from TV. And the president is listening to Rush Limbaugh. The president is listening to Fox and Friends to make decisions of national security, of market, you know, uh, uh, survival, on your 401ks, on holy crap. This is like a Russian wet dream. Vladimir Putin got America for Christmas. I thought all he got was Syria for Christmas. He, oh, hell no. He got America. You, you got uh, uh, three million people going to be kicked off food stamps? By the president, by a stroke of a pen, the stroke of a pen, the agriculture secretary, Sonny Perdue, uh, he kicked off 2018 by uh, signaling that the department wanted these uh, work requirements for people that get SNAP benefits, right? And Congress refused to do it because the, 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 the trade war that this president engaged us in with China disrupted the livelihood of American farmers who grow mostly soybeans. And so the red state uh, uh, senators and the red state house members, they say, oh my God, we got to pass a bill. We, we got to do safety net programs and we got to bail out the farmers because they're taking it up the yin because of this man, right? Well, they passed their farm bill. The president was over there signing it yesterday uh, and it didn't have the food stamp work requirement in it. And all of a sudden the president said, by himself, through the Department of Agriculture, he's going to tighten waiver waivers that are available to states under existing law. And I'll tell you, the states, the red states, use these waivers so that uh, the, the, the 40% of Americans who live in places where states have uh, SNAP waivers in effect, meaning they don't have to work in order to get the SNAP benefits, maybe they're stay-at-home moms, or maybe they're drug addicted, or maybe they're disabled, or what, right? So now they're going to do it by executive order. And here's what it says. It says that uh, able-bodied people ages 18 to 49 with no dependents will be required to work to receive their SNAP benefits, even in states that allow those waivers. One of those waivers, in places where unemployment is 20% higher than the national rates, uh, states can effectively now remove time limits and the work requirement. They got a, a waiver, right? Most states over the last 10 years have used this option and people like the forgotten people who live in economically depressed areas, they, they've gotten their food stamps. Otherwise, they wouldn't have been able to without these waivers. And the Center on Budget and Policy Priorities said that this new uh, rule where for Christmas he's going to take away your food uh, is going to affect 40 percent of Americans who live in places where states have SNAP waivers in effect. The White House said, quote, it's evident that there are able-bodied adults without dependents who are on the food stamp program, and we believe it's in their best interests and their family's best interests to move into an independent lifestyle. There are 3.8 million able-bodied adults without dependents on SNAP. 74% of them, or 2.8 million of them, are not working. Which means 2.8 million people for Christmas will literally have a lump of coal for Christmas and nothing else because there are no jobs in their area and they get snapped. I mean, this is just the sickest administration and the president is blaming Democrat. Democrat. Let, 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 me, let me just do a little flashback for you. This was, this was Trump uh, talking about, uh, you know, when Ted Cruz decided uh, he would shut down the government because Chuck Schumer was holding out for DACA. 
Now, I, I, let me just tell you what's in this continuing resolution as far as border security goes, okay? There is almost $2 billion in this bill for border security. Almost $2 billion, $1.8 billion. It's just that they want modern border security. That's what the Tim Ryan speech was about, okay? They don't want to go back to rotary dial. They don't want to go back to gliders by the Wright brothers. They don't want to go back to the Model T, okay? They want modern border security. They want drones, and they want, uh, you know, uh, uh, all kinds of surveillance. They want, uh, you know, maybe even more border patrol, but they don't want a stinking wall, which is an old way. And uh, there are places you can't even put one, okay? It just can't happen because of the national parks that are there and a whole host of other issues. But I mean, back then when, when you know, the Democrats uh, were gonna give Donald Trump his five billion. Do you remember that? They were gonna give him his five billion. But only if it was in a comprehensive immigration reform bill that actually modernized border security, that actually had comprehensive immigration reform, that gave DACA protections to the Dreamers, an entire package of, uh, it had, um, you know, the, the, uh, uh, the law that said that employers in like slaughterhouses and agricultural, bit, that they had to use the um, immigration line and they had to figure out whether or not these were legal workers or not legal workers. And the not legal work could get work permits and pay taxes, et cetera, et cetera, uh, but not be under the threat of, uh, you know, constant deportation and living in the shadows to bring it. That's how they gave him his five billion. They gave it to him because they they had a whole package of comprehensive immigration reform, which this president does not want. He only wants the money for the wall. So the Democrats said, we'll give you $2 billion, except there's a caveat. You can't spend one nickel of it on a stupid wall. You can spend it on border security. You can spend it on modernization of uh, the, uh, the the border, on drones and on, uh, you know, uh, videotape and, you know, uh, airplanes and all kinds of, you could have all kinds of things, tools uh, that, that have been recommended by DHS for years, right? You could have it. And that's still not enough for him. Well... When the Democrats last did comprehensive immigration reform, Ted Cruz wanted to shut the government down, and the government did shut down, and they, all, they were very successful in blaming Chuck Schumer for it. Well, Donald Trump went a step further, and, pl- and he blamed Obama. Who, who's going to take the blame, Donald? I mean, in the boardroom here, who's getting fired? Who's going to bear the brunt of the responsibility if indeed there is a sh- is shutdown of our government? Well, if you say who gets fired, it always has to be the top. I mean, problems start from the top and they have to get solved from the top. And the president's the leader and he's got to get everybody in a room and he's got to lead. And he doesn't do that. He doesn't like doing that. That's not his strength. You don't do that. You sit in isolation tweeting all freaking day. You have hours and hours of executive time. And then the other time that you're not watching TV, you're golfing. This is sick. Okay, this is really sick. First question, Donald, we're having a hell of a time oh, trying to negotiate here in Washington. So tell me, if you were president, what would you do? Well, very simply, you have to get everybody in a room. You have to be a leader. The president has to lead. I hear the Democrats are going to be blamed and the Republicans are going to be blamed. I actually think the president would be blamed. If there is a shutdown, I think it would be a tremendously negative mark on the president of the United States. He's the one that has to get people together. Mm -hmm. They're not going to be talking who the head of the House was, the head of the Senate, uh, who's running things in Washington. So I really think the pressure is on the president. Shocking, isn't it? He is unmoored, amoral, and tethered to zero principles. This was in 2013. You know in 2013, you know what was on the table? Comprehensive immigration reform. And guess what happened? It passed the Senate. The House wouldn't even introduce it. Paul Ryan wouldn't even put it on the floor. That happened again. It happened in 2008. Comprehensive immigration reform. Same thing. Senate voted for it. House wouldn't even introduce it. Wouldn't put it on the floor. Democrats with Trump said, you could have your $5 billion for border security. You could absolutely have it. But we want comprehensive immigration reform. President wants to stick it into a continuing resolution to fund the government till February 8th, and the Democrats are having none of it because this country needs comprehensive immigration reform. Period. 
Dennis in Buffalo. Yeah. Um, what does it take to get um, to override a veto? Two thirds majority in both houses. Okay. Um, do we have that vote count? Are we do, do we have it in the Senate? And not in the, um, can we get enough Republicans to... Dennis, why don't you just turn on the TV now, okay? Just turn on the TV now, because all they're trying to do now is vote on a procedural vote about whether or not to give the president his $5 billion. And this vote has been held open for hours because they don't have the votes. So, no, the answer to your question is, uh, no, there aren't enough votes to override the president's veto. Oh, okay. But I, I just thought that that was another workaround. And if it, they, it, it if, would be in a normal world, but not this one. No, there aren't the votes to uh, even have a procedural vote right now about whether or not to shut the government down. And we are literally six hours and 21 minutes away from a government freaking shutdown. And we and the Senate is just sitting there uh, holding this vote open, trying to get people to do one thing or another, and, and it's not even happening. Now, if the president gets a bill and he vetoes it because it doesn't have his five bill, then he knows everyone's going to blame him, as they should. Right. Right. Uh, Jahari in Michigan. Hey, Randy. How are you? Good. It's almost, uh, it's what? What time is it? It's almost what? 30 minutes to beer? 20 minutes to beer? Look a lot like Christmas. Yes, it is. Yes, it is. Um, I've wanted to call you on the last show of the year and tell you and your crew that you guys are just awesome. I don't really get to call in a whole lot because of uh, timing and work. And uh, but uh, you guys are just awesome, Thank Randy. You. You've always been awesome. I've I listened to you since I think 2004 when I first discovered you in California uh, on the radio. But, I, re- um, I remember. I remember the first time I ever saw your name, and I didn't know how to pronounce it. I remember that day. I remember, you know, like uh, what is J A H A R I? What is that? What is that? <laughs> I remember that. So basic, yeah, and- basically, you and me, we grew up together. Is what it is. Basically, yeah. basically, yeah. Yeah. I refer people to you to your show all the time on uh, Progressive you. Voices and everything, and uh, and uh, I, I even use Cult Forty Five. I used it with a loan officer yesterday. She had a fit of laughter. Oh <laughs> she yeah. Laughed her butt up. But um, but uh, yeah, you guys do awesome work. You Thank guys you. are awesome. Thank and, you. Very and, much. and I and 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 I recommend uh, newspapers and your. I recommend the show newspapers. Um, That's C-Stan, all it takes. The just federal register. Yes, yeah, ju- I, just re- I, read a new. You know, I, like I said, the best Christmas gift for somebody who disagrees with you or is uninformed or ill-informed or watches Fox News is a newspaper subscription. It is the gift that will give all year long real information. Now, whether they choose to wrap their fish in it or read it is going to be up to them. But you've done the right thing if you gift a newspaper right. subscription. And I, you know, I would say the New York Times, if they're if they're like, you know, like super, super right wing, but also intelligent because it's a it's a very smart newspaper is the Wall Street Journal. If it's like an entry level Washington Post, next level, New York Times level after that. Wall Street Journal. But go ahead and give them a subscription to a newspaper. Let it come every single day. And maybe one day the headline will grab them, like uh, Trump impeached, Trump indicted, Trump organization indicted. You know, Mueller, uh, Mueller's report is out, but you can't see it, whatever. Maybe they'll read it that day. Maybe they will. I think that's a great Christmas present for your racist, crazy uncle. Right, Nino? Right. is the Randy Rhodes Show. To speak with Randy, dial 561-270-3844. That's 561-270-3844. But, but you know what you say? We'll see what happens. Is that a good enough answer for the nearly one million federal workers, many of them law enforcement types, who are not going to get a paycheck after midnight tomorrow night? That's the question. For the Senate Democrats, oh my and God. especially for Chuck Schumer, who oh apparently my Nancy God. Pelosi's bidding, oh rescinded my God. their support for a bill that funds border security only a few weeks ago. Well, why not and have a keep- temporary measure, at least keep these people working, especially as we're getting closer and closer to Christmas? Seriously. Because if the bill doesn't fund border security, then it can't keep America safe. In other words, this isn't just <laughs> Is an issue. Is another month or two going to make much of a difference? 
You know what, Wolf? It makes a difference to the people that get killed by illegal immigrants who are drinking oh, and driving, or who get God. assaulted by gang members that come across oh, the border, or who God. lose their jobs oh, to illegal competition. God. It makes a difference to all of them, Wolf. I'm just. Why don't you then do comprehensive immigration reform, Baldy? Yeah, the big threat in America isn't, uh, you know, from overseas, uh, you know, uh, 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 ISIS groups or, 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 or Al Qaeda remnants. No, it's from toddlers in diapers coming over the southern border. Oh, my God. These people are so disingenuous. They are such liars. They are such schemers. They are, you know, I, listen, women in this country all know that the big threat to their lives isn't a toddler in a diaper. It is a rejected spouse or or, 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 or or a drunk man who beats them. I mean, it's just like, you know, four and five women in this country who are killed are killed by somebody they know. They just, they just make crap up and just shove it out there for racist Uncle Nino. So sick. It's so twisted. And you got a million people that are about to be furloughed. Now, for the last half hour, I have to say, uh, the Chiron on the TV, oh, the Chiron that, that's been on the TV for the last few days, it's been like legendary. But uh, Mitch McConnell is supposed to speak as the government shutdown looms, uh, and yet he hasn't come out of the cloakroom. Because he doesn't have a deal. Leona, I don't know where you are. Ah, uh, Michigan. Oh, hi. Hey, I got a Syria theory. Syria, yeah. Yep. Uh, it is the Saudi government that made a mistake and killed Khashoggi. Yeah. They called Trump. Trump was going to take care of it. Couldn't take care of it because it was more of an outcry. So Turkey started uh, dripping information. And then uh, Trump figured he could do something to stop the information because you had Papeo go out and say, hey, nothing here to see. But then Gina came up and said, um, I have a nope. tape and you should listen yep. to it. And you're going to hear a man screaming, I can't breathe. And then the sound of a bone saw. Right. Then he, uh, Trump called Turkey, said, what can I do? He said, I want the clerk in Pennsylvania. Trump said, can't give them to you, but we can give you the Kurds. Then he said, oh, what, I, what I can also do is give Putin Syria, give him back um, his sanctions. and Because you haven't heard nothing dripping out of Turkey since uh, a couple of weeks ago when all this started to kind of form about Saudi Arabia. So they're going to keep money going in Kushner and Trump's pocket. And uh, Putin gets what he wants. Okay, so think and about think about that. You know, you you probably you know uh, uh, going down the right road here. That's help that. me out here, because no, you're I going need this. down the right road, Leona. You are. You're thinking in in a, in a way that Trump gives the autocrats who can blackmail him everything they are asking for. So just. Yep. Think about what we're saying here. The president of the United States is being controlled by third-rate autocrats, by, by, by Russia, by Turkey, by Bashar al-Assad, uh, by uh, Kim Jong-un. Holy crap, man. And all for a little bit of money. And it all started, well, a lot of it started when they killed um, the journalists and thought nobody would care. I think that's where it all started. Well, it started before that when Flynn said, oh, yeah, oh, yeah we could kidnap a, you know, a guy from Pennsylvania and hand him over to you. We could do that. And he took $600,000 to fulfill that promise from mm -hmm. Erdogan, right? I mean, this is crazy. This is Does absolute mass madness that you have the dirtiest people alive actually in charge of the most awesome, freedom-loving country in the world who are doing transactions based on their own self-dealing and self-enrichment yep. and, and literally having, you know, watching people be killed on tape and shrugging it off and saying, okay, you could have the Kurds. Just leave us alone. You could yep. have the he, Kurds. Putin's pissed. He, he couldn't give them... Uh the clerk like they wanted in Turkey right, right, to right. stop any more drip drip to Saudi Arabia. Well, I don't know. Everybody I, gets something. It's so sick what we're talking about, and yet it, it's so true. It's so true. Listen, I, I want to play Adam Kin Kinzinger. Adam Kinzinger is a dyed-in-the-wool Republican young guy. He's a, 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 a Iraq and a Afghanistan vet, and uh, he's from Illinois. 
And when he heard what was going on in Syria, it, 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 I mean, listen. Is America less safe today with General Mattis's departure, but also the decision to, to, to withdraw troops from Syria and now to draw down troops from Afghanistan? Yes. I mean, yeah, it's, we're less safe. I, I think, you know, does that mean tomorrow something bad's going to happen? You know, hopefully not. Mm -hmm. But what it does mean is Syria now is going to be given over to the Russians and they're emboldened. It's given oh to the Iranians. Assad's emboldened. ISIS, which is not destroyed, is going to go recruit a whole bunch of more people because they just vanquished the United States of America, the president who mm -hmm. ran on being this real tough guy that's going to just destroy ISIS, gave up, it feels like. And and then with these rumors about Afghanistan, you know, it's, it's unbelievable to me at a time when we're supposed to be negotiating with the Taliban that maybe he would signal withdrawal. That, I mean, anything you know about instruments of power and how diplomacy works, it doesn't work by removing a military threat. And in two cases, in two days, that was done. So I, I don't understand. I guess somebody ran, the rumor is Rand Paul got in his ear and overruled oh, all of his national God. security team. There's going to be major consequences to this. Yeah, and and I, I should say, CNN is reporting tonight that that, that drawdown is, is a reality. Uh, I, I wonder, this is, this is a really singular moment here because you have a senior administration official who resigned in protest. He, he didn't walk out and, you know, give some, some uh, background quotes months later. Uh, he left and he, he put a flag in the ground as he left. Um, in your view, should other members of his staff, should other members of the military, should General Dunford, the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, also resign in protest? Well, it's hard, it's hard for me to put myself in their shoes because, you know, you're obviously way, and I heard you guys discuss it, you know, duty to the country mm -hmm. versus a disagreement, mm -hmm. major disagreement. Um, I will tell you, if I was in that position, it would be hard for me to continue because things like Syria, things like Afghanistan, this is 20 years of American policy, and it's easy to say, we just want to bring everybody home for Christmas. And here's a point I want to make. Yeah, we want to have the military home for Christmas, but every one of the members of military are volunteers, right. and they volunteer to kill America's enemies and to protect our country. So this idea that you're somehow doing a favor by bringing everybody home for Christmas, yeah, it, it's like a sugar rush. You're going to enjoy being being home for Christmas for a moment, but I'll tell you, the military is absolutely disheartened by this. I, I, I mean, I'm hearing it from my friends a lot mm. of what is the president thinking? And, mm. you know, look, what can we do about it besides speak out? You know, Congress has to be loud about this. There's no, obviously, enforcement mechanism because the president's the commander in chief. But I will tell you, among my colleagues I was talking to on the floor tonight, there is a lot of concern like I have never seen in my life. Wow. And then Maggie Haberman, actually, uh, she, she, she put a period on it, and she said the GOP is splitting. It is splitting apart. It's the talk radio, Fox and Friends, Rush Limbaugh crowd versus the serious Republican crowd. We're at a critical moment. The number of conservatives who I have talked to in the last day who worked on the campaign, who supported the president, who now say, you know what? I regret doing that. Um, this this was a mistake. Uh, this administration is 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 you know off the rails. Um, all of these investigations that are coming to a head are going to be a huge problem. Um, they are disgusted, for lack of a better word, with what they have seen um, out of uh, the the details that came out of Michael Cohen's plea deal. Um, all of that is going to keep going. That's not abating. That's going to actually intensify as we get into the year and. Oh, it takes 20 senators mm -hmm. to vote in favor of impeachment, 20 Republican senators to vote in favor of impeachment. Um, this could be a critical moment. It also could not be. The president has, ha has been to the precipice before and has pulled back, but, but I think this one might be different. He is destroying this country. He literally is destroying this country from within. And I've always said, and it's on those commercials, you know, with the song, Tell Me Is It Right Now?, Tell me, is it right now to give into the night? Pray for me. Pray for me. That's for our country. And it says on the Chiron, on that commercial that I made, it says we will never be destroyed from without. We will only be destroyed from within. And we're being destroyed from within because Vladimir Putin has managed to get an agent, an asset to do the dirty work of destroying America from within, knowing, knowing 
that he doesn't have the military prowess to do it from without knowing that he doesn't have the world, uh, you know, uh, on his side to destroy America, knowing that he doesn't have allies, knowing he doesn't have a military uh, to do it, knowing any war that uh, Vladimir Putin starts or, or attempts to start will be at sea. You watch. It'll be, you know what, Ro watch Hunt for Red October, because that's what this is starting to feel like. But that's how, you know, Vladimir Putin decided he couldn't do it. So he decided to do it this way. Insert a Russian asset who's got his fingers, his little tiny, tiny paws all over the levers of power to destroy every institution, to defund every institution. That's what a government shutdown would do. It would defund the Justice Department. It would defund TSA. It would defund. These people will go to work, but they will not get paid. And then come next year, they're going to have to go back to Congress and ask for all this back pay. And if the president is correct that he intends to shut the government down for a long time, Congress won't have the wherewithal, the money, nothing to pay these people their back pay, just like the vets got stiffed. He's destroying this country bit by bit daily, 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 daily. The economy with the tariffs, the stock market, uh, the, the morale, an Ameri a spirit for America, the love of country. Uh, he's, he's invoked tribalism and one American sets upon another now. We can't even get unified over, uh, you know, national security. going to starve, what, 2.8 million people with the stroke of a pen. He's going to change the laws of immigration with a stroke. Thank God, thank God the Supreme Court said no to him today. I will tell you, Kavanaugh was right there with the, the crazies. He was. But uh, the Chief Justice joined the four normal ones. And, uh, you know, Ruth Bader Ginsburg was allowed from her hospital bed to cast her vote to say the president cannot undo the law with regard to asylum uh, by a stroke of his pen. But listen, you know, enjoy your family while you can. Get into some good conversations, decent conversations about what you will do if the shit hits the fan. I'm serious. I've always said I would tell you when. I don't want to ruin your holiday or anything, but it's time to have a plan. Have a plan. Merry Christmas. Buy a stinking podcast.